Welcome to the second of our videos on the overview of ARC 331 and 332. This second video will focus on types of structural action. The most common, three most common types of structural action are tension, compression, and bending. So the first image here shows a 1 8 inch diameter piece of plastic welding rod. It's about six inches long, it's in tension, and you'll notice it's holding a substantial amount of weight, in this case 20 pounds. It could actually have held over 100 pounds, but I didn't bother putting that on. Here is the same element. It started off straight. We put some weights on it, which are a tiny fraction of what this is, and at some point it snapped to the side, so it was straight and then it buckled off to the side. And this is a phenomenon we call elastic instability, where the element in compression is not stiff enough that it's forced to stay under the load. So we could put some bracing elements that would have helped hold this member from snapping to the side or buckling to the side. We could have also made it a hollow tube or changed its cross-section in some way so that it was less vulnerable to buckling. Buckling is our shorthand word, by the way, for what we call elastic instability, wherein the shape of the member begins to change abruptly before the yield stress of the material has been reached. So in this case, we had a block of wood in here that we used to stop this collapse in mid-collapse. Uh, if that piece of wood hadn't been there, the whole thing would have continued on the bow in this piece of PVC welding rod would have increased dramatically until eventually it would have yielded, and all of these weights would have come crashing down on the table. We know this is elastic instability because when we lift the weight up off of it, this member went back to its original shape, which says the material has not been yielded, uh, and the buckling was initiated by this instability rather than by the yielding of the material. So here we have a stretching force putting tension in the member. Here we have a, a compression force uh, putting an axial compression force into the member. And here's our third form of uh, structural action, which we call bending. So again, we have a six inch long piece of this eighth inch diameter uh, welding rod. This was straight. Then we loaded it up with these weights and basically at this point uh, the addition of a tiny amount of weight caused the member to snap through and the system to collapse. Efficiency wise, if the material works well in tension, such as steel or aluminum, then axial tension is by far the most efficient way to use material. Um, a distant second in most cases is axial compression, and a distant third is bending. In addition to those three modes of failure, which uh, modes of uh, structural action, uh, they are by far the most common, axial tension, axial compression, and bending. We have, in addition to those three, another which is called torsion. And in this case, we have uh, some styrene sheet, a sixteenth of an inch in diameter, that's been made into a tube. Then we took the same sized four faces of this and glued them together into a kind of slab. And then we took the same amount of uh, styrene sheet and created this um, I-beam. So, this little demonstration is supposed to show how much better a tube is than an I-beam when it comes to torsion. I-beams work great for bending. They're very poor for torsion. So we almost never have any kind of tension elements with some, without some sort of compression elements or bending elements that they can work off of. So here is an example of a common application of a tension member. This is a steel rod. That's a steel rod. This steel creates a frame, and these steel rods are then used to stabilize the frame. 
So if we have a force going in this direction, parallel to these members, this member will go into tension, that member will go into compression, and that becomes the means of preventing the lateral movement of the building. When this one goes into tension, this one goes slack, or if these two things are counter-tensioned, which they typically are, then this will go into a higher state of tension, and the tension will diminish in this when we have a wind force in this direction. So cross-bracing is a common way of using tension members. By the way, down here there's a threaded end connection which is used for the counter-tensioning. Uh, almost all tension elements in buildings have some kind of built-in adjustment of this sort. Here's another example of cross-bracing. So for a wind force in this direction or a seismic force in that direction, this element will go into tension, this element will go into compression, that element will go into tension, compression, tension and the loads get t transferred back into some other part of the building which eventually has to lead all of those forces down to the foundation. Here's another example of cross bracing. So under a lateral seismic load for example these points want to move in that direction which creates tension in this member, compression in that member, tension there and so forth. Now, all the things I've shown so far are examples of simple cross-bracing systems, but we can use much more complex systems. For example, this is the Cathedral of Christ the Light in Oakland, California, designed by Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. Here is a, an external surface that's a portion of a cone. Here's another external per surface that's a portion of a cone. The interior surfaces right here and right there are portions of two different spheres that are not concentric with each other. In between this spherical interior surface and this conical external surface are a series of compression struts and crossed brace tension members which allow the structure to resist not just wind or lateral forces but gravity forces. So this is the interior view of that building and all that lattice work with the tension and compression members is external to this uh, wood louver system. So those are classic sort of tension cross bracing systems. We can use suspension elements also to support a roof. So this is the Dulles International Airport in Washington DC. Uh, these cables right here are what support the roof. These are very delicate cables made out of uh, steel, high strength steel, which yields at 270,000 pounds per square inch of cross section. So this enormous span with this huge load is handled by those very delicate cables. Uh, this is the view of the completed building. Now, whenever we have lightweight cables supporting a roof, if the roof itself is also lightweight, then we end up with a problem something like this. So this is how we imagine it working under gravity load. Here is how it works under the disturbance of wind load. It flies around violently and eventually rips itself apart. So in the case of Dulles Airport, uh, they resisted the wind load by, first of all, putting uh, concrete planks here. So those planks were enough to prevent this kind of effect like this, which we call kiting. But the planks were not sufficient to keep some movement back and forth under uh, wind load. And so there was another slab of concrete put on the top of this and formwork was used to allow that concrete to come down between the planks. And all of that added some beam-like stiffness that kept this, this roof from rocking first from that side to that side. Um, we have some great structural examples in our long-span bridges, and those can be applied to buildings. Here we have a tower supporting the cables, and another tower over here. Um, any of you who have ever walked across a child's bridge in a playground that's a tension bridge, you know that uh, 
under shifting loads, it changes shape. So this would be the perfect shape for these cables under a perfectly uniform load. Uh, unfortunately, the load is not always uniform. For example, you could have an accident and have a huge convoy of trucks uh, piling up in one location here, which would tend to make this portion of the bridge sag downward. Uh, and that would cause this portion to lift upward. And that's not good for stability of vehicular traffic. So what they did in the case of the Golden Gate Bridge was they said the primary uniform load is handled by these suspension elements uh, and these suspenders, these vertical suspenders. The primary gravity load, the uniform gravity load is handled by that. And any kind of asymmetric load is handled by the stiffness of this truss along the side of the bridge. So the primary expected load, the uniform load, is handled by the cables. The asymmetric load is handled by the um, trusses on the side. Now, we can take that metaphor and we can apply it to a building. In this case, we didn't have a place to anchor it, uh, anchor the, the tension elements. So uh, we needed a different uh, system. This is the uh, Federal Reserve Bank building in Minneapolis. This is the tension structure that's supporting all the floors. Uh, the floors down here are suspended off of that with suspenders. The floors here are delivering their loads to that suspension element through the compressive action or column action of these members. So on the external part of the building, Loads get carried down to the sus suspension element, back up to the top of the tower, and subsequently down through the tower to the footing. Now, this tension cable, or tension uh, structure rather, by, rather, tends to pull the towers inward because it creates, at this connection point, both a vertical force and a horizontal force. That horizontal force has to be resisted by something and this truss work at the top becomes the compression member that allows it to work. So we have compression across the top here, tension in this element right here. Now, we also have incorporated in this top element, we have incorporated a truss-like element which mimics the behavior of this truss along the side of the Golden Gate Bridge. You'll notice this is a fairly shallow proportions when we get to the Federal Reserve Bank, the depth of this compared to the span is relatively deep, which produces a very stiff truss. And we need that because our tolerance of movement in a building like this is even less than it would be on the road bridge, like the Golden Gate Bridge, because we have glass in this facade and uh, racking of the, of the openings or the framing for the glass will cause the glass to break. So this shows during construction, the Federal Reserve Bank. Here we have the compression members here, uh, the towers supporting the vertical component of the suspension element, and then the horizontal component. These towers are not very good at resisting the horizontal component. The towers would get pulled over, but here we have this compression truss work, which is holding the towers apart. This is a close-up that shows the columns above delivering load to the tension member. And then over here we have the suspenders down below. These columns are rendered as wide flanges so that they work well as columns and they don't buckle. These elements here and there and there all have tension in them and they are rendered as these thin slabs, one inch thick by eight inches wide, which are set edge on to provide the best possible view through the glazing. This is what that building looks like finished. Here's a close up that shows the way in which the facade was handled below where all these suspension elements are occurring. The glazing has been pulled out to the facade and the mullions have been made minimal sort of suggesting the delicacy of those elements that are acting in tension. All of these elements, which are acting as columns, they're acting in compression. The glass has been recessed back and the columns have been wrapped in this black material to emphasize the greater weight of those elements.
and that effect is pretty dramatic when you look at the building from off the, at the side because the depth of these uh, columns um, essentially turns the upper part of this building black as you view it from the side and then the light captured from the sky or reflected from the sky makes this portion look uh, very delicate by comparison. So in this case, we have a compression member that's straight across the top, and our tension member that's working in concert with that is curved. We can reverse that where we have a compression member that's curved in the form of an arch, and then the tension member is across the bottom. And to emphasize that point, we'll look here and see that joint. Uh, this is that arch coming down, and this is the tension member that holds this uh, pylon from being forced outward horizontally. This building, by the way, spans from here to there. It's roughly a city block, and underneath it are a series of railways, which are all converging to a railway station, and they're curving, and their, their pattern and location is complicated enough that it turned out to be easier to just span the structure from one side to the other. This is an example like the, the uh, Federal Reserve Bank building. It's about a city block of span, and it's what we would call pretty long span, roughly 300 feet, and high load because it has the concrete slab load and the live load from 10 stories of occupied space. Now, uh, all the examples I've shown so far are stabilized against wind uplift by dead weight. That includes the roof of the Dulles Airport, but also the Federal Reserve Bank and um, the Broadgate Exchange House. This building, the Federal Reserve Bank, the Broadgate Exchange House have enormous amounts of weight in the floor slab, so they're not going to take off and kite. Uh, but sometimes it's sort of philosophically abhorrent to some people to say, well, we're going to deal with the gravity load of these super delicate cables, and then we're going to deal with a wind uplift with huge masses of concrete. So we can use cables in a, an alternate system, and this is one of them. This is the Virginia Beach Convention Center designed by Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill in which they're using lenticular cable trusses. So there is a steel cable, a high strength steel cable with a yield stress capacity of 270,000 pounds a square inch. Here's another cable. And then the compression member is down the middle. This compression member is a round tube because that works really well to resist buckling and also to resist any kind of torsion that might occur in the system. So this is what that looks like. Here's one of those cables. Here's the other cable. And by the way, contained within these elements are threaded connectors that can be used to counter tension them against each other to make sure that they don't go slack under wind load and also to make sure that the elements are straight and have the right dimensions. And by the way, steel cable comes with uh, some wiggles in it. And if you really want to get it dimensionally accurate, you have to stretch it out with some sort of adjustments of that sort. Now here we have, these are what I call planar elements. So here's a cable that's in the same plane as that cable. Those two cables are counter tensioning each other, but the counter tensioning cables don't necessarily have to be in the same plane. So as an example, this is the Seattle Tacoma International Airport um, designed by Fentress Corporation or Fentress Architects. These cables have a curvature here to resist wind over pressure against this facade. And then there's cables with curvature in the opposite direction that are there to resist outward suction on the facade. And the cables that resist outward suction and the cables that resist inward pressure are counter tension so that they don't go slack. And by the way, the compression elements that allow that to work are these columns, 
plus some bending moment in these or bending in these beams up above. Uh, that bending is a pretty severe problem, so we don't want those cantilevers to be too long, which is why these compression elements and these cables are pretty close to each other. This is another example of a countertension cable network. This is Dorton Arena. These are the parabolic arches that were constructed initially. Then uh, steel cables were suspended across um, and those were then countertensioned against wind cables. So the cables going this direction are the gravity cables, the cables going that direction are the wind cables. And that's one of the downsides of a, a tension system is because it doesn't work in compression, it can't handle um, loads in different directions. Uh, so we end up having basically two cable networks, but it's still worth it because the cables are so incredibly efficient that this was a super lightweight, super economical structure. This is what it looks like in an aerial photograph. This is what it looks like from the roof. So that's a person standing on the other side, uh, almost exactly one football field of distance away. It's all free span. There are no columns underneath that cable network. This is what it looks like from the ground and what it looks like from the inside. It's a beautifully daylit space. It's a very dramatic space and it's been amazingly versatile in its applications. These are some of the tensioning elements that are used to keep that cable network on the roof um, from flopping around or any cables from going slack in a wind. The third common form of structural action is bending. In this case, when people walk on this plywood, they bend the plywood they're exerting a force perpendicular to the member. Likewise, when people walk on this floor, they put bending in these joists, these wooden joists, because they are applying a force perpendicular to the direction or to the axial direction of those beams. So we have uh, three things we always have to account for when it comes to bending action. Some uh, beams will tend to fail in shear, some will tend to fail in what we call moment capacity, and some in stiffness. So first of all, we're going to talk about shear because uh, sometimes we can put things together and make them act in a, what we call composite action. Um, a beam might actually fail if it's a fairly deep heavily loaded beam, a wooden beam can fail due to shear along those planes. Um, but we can also make a very good beam by figuring out a way to make things work along these planes. So this is a glue lamb beam, a section. These are five and a half inches that way, one and a half inches that way, and we've glued one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten layers into a beam that's 15 inches deep. Um, so the key thing here is this glue has to work, otherwise we'll have that kind of failure for absolute certainty. So just to illustrate this point, on the top here we have a piece of black plexiglass with a little weight on it. This is eighth inch thick plexi. And here I've stacked up 10 of these. There's no glue between them. And then loaded them up with 10 times that much load. And what we see is we're getting about the same deflection here as we get there. In other words, if we just lay these things on top of each other, uh, they will tend to slide over each other in this shear deformation that we described here. In other words, there is a shear deformation where the things are not staying glued together and they are sliding past each other. We're actually getting that. So if we looked at these ends here, we'd see exactly that kind of deformation. So what this says is we can stack 10 of them on top of each other and they will be as strong as, 10 times as strong as just one of them by itself. On the other hand, if we care, compare 10 of them 
uh, not glued, stacked on top of each other to 10 of them glued. Notice that we have much more weight here and yet no discernible deflection, whereas here we have an amount of deflection that we would never consider satisfactory in a floor, that kind of proportional deformation. So this emphasizes the importance of glue and you need to make sure that the glue has adequate strength but also that the glue is not going to crystallize or age in a way where it becomes unreliable. One of the glues that we use is called Resorcinol. It's a two component glue. It's water resistant and generally its lifetime is as long or longer than the wood. Um, I don't know of any other glues myself that are reliable in that regard, although there may be some modern glues that have been worked out. We can also get composite action between something like a wide flange uh, steel beam and the concrete deck that goes on top of it, but we can't glue concrete down to the steel like we glued the layers of wood together. So what we do is we weld something called shear studs and the concrete then gets poured on top to create the concrete decking and the concrete surrounds the shear studs and when this beam goes into bending and the top flange is in compression and it's tending to get shorter under that compression, the shear studs transfer a lot of that force into the concrete uh, decking and the concrete decking actually adds not only to the cross section of the beam but to the overall depth of the beam. So these shear studs that didn't cost very much are giving us a huge benefit in terms of increased bending capability. So in the course we'll talk more and more about things like uh, shear in the beam which is largest near the ends of the beam and moment which is largest near the middle uh, but for the moment we're just gonna we're gonna go over this pretty quickly but you know that one of the common ways a beam can fail is to have this tearing on the bottom of the beam if you've ever broken a stick, you understand what this means. If I gave you a two by four and I said, break it, you would turn it flat down and put a, a support under each end of it and you jump up and down in the middle of it with the ex expectation that you're going to get this kind of failure. Uh, we call that moment failure or sometimes bending failure. So, and the, and the bending moment is worse at the center of the beam so one of the ways we can address that is we can reshape the beam where we make it deeper. So in this case, we have these glass mullions that are spanning from here up to there, and they've been made deeper near the middle uh, as a way of responding to this more severe moment at the middle. This is another example. These are simple span beams with the worst moment in the middle under gravity. They've been made much deeper here than at the ends of the beams to address that moment issue. Uh, here we have cantilevers coming off of this uh, central support line. These cantilevers have the worst moment at the base or the root of the cantilever. So that's where the cantilever has been made the deepest and it's the shallowest out near the end. And all of this is intuitively logical to you. Your arms are thicker at the shoulder than they are at the fingertips. Uh, tree limbs are thicker where the limbs meet the trunk than they are out at the tip. And so this is just mimicking what nature has figured out needs to be done. Okay, here's another example under the huge inward pull of these steel cables with enormous amounts of concrete sitting on this roof. These columns are tending to get pulled over and inward. Um, this is the formwork for one of those columns. This shows the steel cage and the steel reinforcing for a column that has yet to be wrapped in the formwork. So concrete is going to be put down in this formwork. The formwork will then get moved down to this column and they'll continue along. This steel is the tension steel that's necessary to make this beam work. Notice how dense it is at the outside of the column or in this case, the cantilever beam that's coming out of the foundation. So on this side of these elements, there's a huge amount 
of that steel. And by the way, there's no daylight coming through that steel, but there are openings between it. There have to be in order for the concrete to get around the steel and bond to the steel. But just to give you a sense of how much rebar is there, uh, no matter how you look through that dense collection of steel rebar, you don't see any daylight through there. You sort of see a little daylight up here maybe, but pretty dense with steel. So this is an example of a tapered cantilever. This beam that's coming out of the foundation is being pulled over by these forces, and there's a lot of tension on the outside to make this work. At an even larger scale, we can treat a building as a beam projecting out of the ground. So this is the Transamerica building in San Francisco, which can be subjected to high wind loads, but even higher seismic loads. And the, beam, the, the building has been made wider at the base uh, to give it a greater bending capacity and greater stability. This is a similar treatment. This is the Burj Khalifa the tallest building in the world, which was designed by Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, which tapers from a wide base to a very narrow tip. And none of this is terribly new to us. This is the Eiffel Tower in Paris, which is one of the most iconic structures in the world. And we will talk about it because it has many innovative features and it was built back in the 1800s. And then we have, this is Bank One building in Chicago, where the width of the building at the base has been made dramatically wider than at the top um, as an indicator of the need to resist that bending moment at the base. So those are all examples of either simple span beams or cantilevered beams. Sometimes we end up with mixtures. For example, this frame under gravity load on the top of this roof um, this element right here is a cantilever. There's tension on the outside, compression on the inside. This element's a cantilever, compression on the inside, tension on the outside. And then from about that point over to there, it's more like simple span with compression on the top and tension on the bottom. In every case though, we're making it deeper wherever the moment or the bending moment is the most severe. Here it's less severe, so we've tend to make that part we've tended to make that part much shallower. The final bending moment failure or the bending failure rather is stiffness, where the element just deflects too much. This can be disturbing to people on floors because they uh, perceive too much motion and it makes them nervous or distracts them. It can also be a, a more of a safety issue on roofs. If you have a flat roof and you have a rainstorm, if the rain causes enough deflection that the roof deflects downward or creates a bowl shape, that bowl shape will hold more water, which will add more load, which will cause more deflection, which will, will collect more water. This is a, a failure that ultimately uh, culminates because there wasn't adequate stiffness to make sure that the rain was shed. So we've already seen this example. This is a structural element that's way too shallow and deflecting so much it can't even support its own weight. When we turn it vertical like this, um, it's then stiff enough and able to uh, provide us with uh, an adequate uh, resistance to deflection. Uh, we already learned, of course, that that's not a very stable beam. Um, it has compression in the top. It tends to deflect to the side. Uh, so we need to stabilize that top edge. And there are a number of ways to do it. In wood construction, when we nail the decking down, we're actually stabilizing that top edge through the diaphragm action of the wood. Uh, we can also make a beam which is self-stabilizing. In other words, it doesn't require the decking to be stabilized. We can imagine taking that material that has this shape and giving it this shape instead. In the case of steel, we can do that by just basically using gigantic, massive pieces of machines, of machinery that will take this, and through a series of rollings, they squeeze it out into this shape. Um, so again, we have this thin sheet that's uh, too flexible, this thin sheet that's too laterally unstable, 
if we take all that material and we reconfigure it, we have a top flange, a bottom flange, and a vertical web. And this is fairly stiff and much stronger than any of the other configurations. So this is what that section looks like. This is what we call a wide flange beam. This is the flange on the top. That's the flange on the bottom. And this is the web that connects them together. So this is a very common building element um, that we will talk about at length and we'll learn even how to size these for a variety of configurations or situations. And we'll learn how to put a dollar value on the cost of the material and the cost of installation. Sometimes you'll find these wide flange or eye sections in places that might surprise you a little bit. We talked about this building, which has a suspension element and a compression element that's allowing it to span a city block. And then it's spanning with trusses in the other direction. Um, these loads from the cables are coming down on massive concrete elements here and there. And now we have an interesting issue, which is wind load in this direction is tending to blow this building over. And so this element and that element have been knit together with a web member. So we actually see in cross section an I section, which is there uh, to cantilever out of the foundation and keep this building from blowing over. Now, for rolled sections, the cross section has to be uniform all along the length because the rolling system won't accommodate variations. But if we make I sections out of welded up plate, we can actually adjust the width or the thickness of these flanges or even the shape of the beam over its length. And if we use a plastic material like concrete, we can cast it in any form we want. So here on the end where shear is the issue, we have a big chunky set of material. Here we have a thin element that represents the tension cables going through. And then the wide flange has gotten wider near the center, reflecting the fact that we have more moment there. But also for stability purposes, that's where we want material to go. So this is like a beautifully optimized beam. The only trick they haven't played is they haven't adjusted the depth of the beam. They've adjusted everything else. Okay, so that covers our discussion, our initial discussion of bending. And now we're going to talk about torsion. I already mentioned that this is a certain amount of styrene sheet, which is configured here in a tube. Here it's configured in a slab. Same amount of material here configured into a wide flange. You'll notice that the greatest twisting or deformation is in the wide flange, which means it's really bad from a point of view of torsion, especially when you realize that the weight out here that's causing that torsion is much, much lower than the weight here, and yet there is no discernible torsional deformation in this tube. So under torsion, tubes are very good. A slab is a little better than a wide flange, but the wide flange is definitely worse. So here's a, a situation where we have uh, a curved support for this bridge. That support is in bending from that support point to that support point. Um, it's also curving outward, which means it's under torsion. And that torsion is particularly severe if all the people who are loading it are on this side of the bridge so that they're tending to make the bridge twist over badly. So the element that's been chosen there to resist that torsion is um, a round tube, which works well in bending and works really well in torsion. Here's another example. We could have a whole lot of vehicular traffic on the outside here plus the curvature is causing a twisting to occur in this direction. Um, in order to resist that, the cross section of this is made tubular. Uh, this is a more common situation. It's not a curved structural element. It's at the boundary of the building. There's a beam here, which has to support the, the joist running across here, which supports the concrete slab. 
And then we apply this extremely concentric load of the bricks. So the brick force is coming here. The beam is supported there which is tending to create torsion or a twisting action. And in this case, what we typically do is we make this a rectangular tube. It's made deeper than wide to handle the gravity loads, but it's definitely made tubular to handle the torsional loads associated with this eccentric brick load. And we cannot tolerate much torsional deformations because bricks crack really easily and they are very unforgiving of any kind of deformation. So that completes our second overview video, which is focusing on types of structural action.